a Saturday afternoon, like I was telling these guys, I'm talking to you people then, I was telling these guys before we started, if as a Canadian who lives in the dark most of the time, if I lived here, I'd be on the beach right now. You could not pay me. Actually, it's a little too high noon. Probably I'd be taking a break from the beach right about now just to save my skin. So anyway, we are specifically going to talk about bioregulator peptides today. Um, the peptide landscape, as Caroline kind of alluded to, has been shifting for the last several months. And the bioregulator peptides, with the exception of one, <laughs> is still fair game. Um, which is really interesting. So I'm going to go through the presentation. We're going to talk a little bit about how bioregulators are different than the longer chain peptides that people are more familiar with and also the different forms that they take. What's interesting about the bioregulators is that, you know, if, I, if you've heard about them, you've heard about them as a regenerative kind of improving your biological age tool. Bad news is that the person who created, who discovered them, the man who spent the better part of his professional career studying them, researching them, I mean, for four decades, tragically passed away in December at the not so ripe old age of 77. And the reason why I'm telling you this is because although we don't have a lot of detail about what happened to Dr. Cavinson, what we do know is that you know, he was under a lot of stress over the last number of years, and we don't know much about his lifestyle and how he was living his life. And so I'm prefacing this presentation to impress upon you a point that I will repeat repeatedly, and that is that the bioregulators can only really do what they do if we do the rest of the work, right? We have to clear the terrain. We have to take care of our body. We have to live the proper lifestyle, eat the right diet. We have to do all the things to allow these incredible little tiny compounds to work their magic. So with that said, let's go. So imagine that this little boy is more, you need to use your imagination, don't close your eyes, look at his face, but imagine that he's kind of morphing into an old man in back. That's what this is supposed to be. Aging is a thing that's going to happen to all of us. We can kick, we can scream, we can talk about anti-aging, we can talk about reversing aging, but the fact of the matter is that there is no stopping the clock. The question is, how are we gonna age, right? So as people in this space, we have an obsession <laughs> because this is what is associated with aging, right? So we're going to decline our bodies will physically decline, our brains will decline, everything. Mother Nature has a playbook, right? Mother Nature is like, okay, here's the deal. We've got all these creatures on Earth. They're gonna procreate. We need the old to make way for the young. So therefore, we have a playbook. We have a playbook that through our reproductive years, she takes really good care of us. And particularly women, once our hormones kind of go away, once we get through menopause, she's like, Okay, we're done with you, thank you, on to the next. She might keep us around a little bit to take care of the grandkids, but that's about it, right? <laughs> um, so in our world today, we're like, yeah, actually that's not gonna work for me. <laughs> because I'm not ready to go, I got things to do, I wanna be around for my grandkids, I wanna see them get married, I might be born to be around for my great grandkids, oh, and I also I don't wanna have them when I'm 20. So we have a whole different plan in place, and so we talk about anti-aging, we talk about age reversal. So if we're gonna talk about anti-aging, we're going to have to imagine that this is how we're gonna age. This is what we're after, every one of us. We wanna be vital, we wanna have our heads together, right? We wanna remember our name and the name of everybody else in the room. We want to enjoy our life and we have the luxury in the country that we live in that this might be accessible to us, right? The whole, there are many countries in the world that don't have this luxury. This is not what they're worried about. They're worried about making it another day. In this country, we're, we're like the spoiled toddlers of the world, right? We have this luxury. So if we have this luxury, what do we have to do to get there? The first thing we have to do is we have to solve. We have to understand why we get old. We have to understand why do we die? So there are, you know, there are many diseases of aging, but these are really the four major players. We've got Diabetes, which is really stands for metabolic dysfunction, and we know that in North America, the lion's share of us, or 
of people, not so much the people in this room and probably not many of the people watching, but for the most part, if we look outside of our little bubble, people are, are suffering from metabolic imbalances. This is preventable, it's preventable by lifestyle. Cancer is another big one, and not to assign blame, I, I never lay blame on anybody, but the truth of the matter is that living our lifestyle differently, there's a reasonable chance that many cancers could be avoidable. Cardiovascular disease, lifestyle. Sorry to tell you guys, in, with the rare exception of the odd person that's born with congenital deformity, for the most part, cardiovascular disease is preventable and treatable through lifestyle and other interventions. And finally, neurodegenerative disease. So increasingly, neurodegenerative disease is being linked to metabolic dysfunction, it's being linked to vascular disease, cardiovascular, right, vascular disease, it's lifestyle, it's diet. Yes, again, there are many unknowns. We don't, we haven't saw it's microbiome, it's so many different things, it's inflammation. But again, lifestyle, we can work towards solutions. And there's more every day. There's more information about how we can avoid these things. But the fact of the matter is, oh look, now we have animation. <laughs> Welcome. Um, aging is complex. It's not necessarily complicated. I had a teacher once that said, you know, make the distinction between complicated and complex. Right? So there's so many different factors that play into aging. And what we want is to age well. Now, there are many different theories on why we age. One of the most prevalent are the hallmarks of aging. And the interesting thing about this theory is that it continues to evolve. There used to be six hallmarks of aging. Then there were nine hallmarks of aging. A couple of years ago, they threw in three more. There's a reasonable chance that another year or two from now, there's gonna be another three because we're trying to understand what are all of the different pieces of what's happening in the human body at a cellular level that drives aging, right? A lot of it is happening at, at a cellular level. Now what's interesting about this wheel, and I wish I could, oh, I do give the source. There's, these guys were brilliant, but I think they were selling supplements. Why? Because <laughs> in the middle of the wheel, we have three different, um, three different compounds that are represented. Notice that the middle of the wheel, the brown, those little brown squares, that's spermidine. Spermidine is a fascinating compound. So I'm not really going to talk about spermidine today, but we could do a whole presentation on spermidine and how it, at a cellular level, helps to impact cellular, our cellular aging, inflammation, everything, foundationally. And you know what's interesting about spermidine is where was it discovered? Do we know? Male sperm. That's why it's called sperm. And what's its job? It wraps itself around sperm. It protects the DNA on its journey to to its final destination. Spermidine is the most fascinating compound, and it's probably one of the most important anti-aging compounds that we're still learning about. Right. So. It's not a bioregulator, so we're not going to talk about it too much, but I think it's super cool. RSV, that's resveratrol. I think resveratrol is interesting because they're still, if you put the two right people in the room, there will be blood all over the walls. <laughs> because half the population thinks that resveratrol, uh, the research population believes that resveratrol is amazing, and the other half calls bullshit on the whole thing. Sorry, am I allowed, am I allowed to say that? Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yes. Um, <laughs> the other half calls, calls BS on it. And the jury's out. I think there's a lot of interesting stuff about resveratrol, but interestingly enough, there's a whole lot of pain here. There's only a couple of the hallmarks of aging that it doesn't seem to impact. Um, and then the blue, I need my glasses, excuse me. I haven't done this. Oh, NMN. NMN, right? NAD, that cellular source of en energy. Really important, really interesting. The trick, of course, with NMN is how do, how do we get it in a bioavailable form? Again, not our topic today. And finally, oh, calcium alpha-ketoglucarate. Really interesting compound. Again, we're starting to see these stacks show up in anti-aging stacks. So anyway, this is the 12 hallmarks of aging. This is one theory. There's also another, there's lots of other theories. Today, we're gonna really feed into the peptide theory of aging. And the peptide theory of aging basically was developed by this gentleman who is who I was referring to at the beginning of this, of this talk. This is Dr. Kevinson, and this guy, from his early 20s, when he was first approached by the Russian military and given a job, and they tasked him, they said, Vladimir, here's what you're going to do. 
our astronauts are coming back from space a hot mess. The submarine dudes are coming back from their nuclear submarine missions a hotter mess. We need you to figure out how to reverse that stuff. Here's a blank check. You can have as much money as you need. We'll build you the labs. We've got factories filled with people that you can run <coughs> experiments on. You can have all the lab animals first, and then you got the people. Just go to town. So I'm sure Vladimir was both really excited and super freaked out. <laughs> can you no, no big deal. I'll just solve for aging. No problem. Anyway, the good news is that he discovered, he discovered peptide bioregulators. And basically, his statement here kind of says it all. Peptide bioregulators regenerate organs impaired by aging, disease, and trauma. If we can do that, if we can rebuild tread on the tires, imagine how much better we can age. Right? If we solve for inflammation, if we solve for chronic stress, if we solve for toxins and all those other things, and we can help our organs to regenerate from the inside by signaling molecules that are native to our bodies, there's almost no limit to what we can achieve. So the reason why this slide is up, and it looks super complicated, but it's not, the point of this slide is that what he figured out really early on in the game is that these bioregulator peptides are present in every life form in nature. And generally speaking, when scientists find things that are preserved across all species of life in nature, they kind of like, hmm, if it's that important, we're onto something. And that's how he really kind of figured out and decided that he was going to focus on these. So what are bioregulator peptides? Many of you are probably familiar with peptides in general. So the BPC-157, the thymosin alpha-1, the thymosin beta-4, the growth hormone secretagogues, those are what we would refer to as longer chain peptides. So they're 50 amino acids or less. They're generally signaling molecules. So they attach to receptors on the, outs on the cell membrane and they will initiate cascades at a cellular level that will drive tissue, tissue healing not so much regeneration, right? Or they may stimulate a part of the brain to release and produce growth hormone, for example, in the case of growth hormone secretagogues. The bioregulator peptides are almost a subset of these. They are only two to four amino acids long. So an amino acid, if you have kids and they, or you or your children ever played with Legos, remember those little single blocks? That's an amino acid. So in a bioregulator peptide, we have two to four of those blocks. They're actually the most fascinating thing on the planet because there's, there's at least 21 bioregulator peptides that are commercially available. There are more out there. So out of two to four, two times three times four is not that big a number. But not only is it the combination of these amino acids, it's also their orientation in space that determines what role they play. And what's I'm gonna keep saying what's really interesting. Let's just assume it's interesting, right? So another thing about bioregulator peptides is the way they work. The way they work is they cross the cellular membrane. They cross the nuclear membrane. So that means they're getting into the nucleus of the cell. And what lives in the nucleus of your cell? Your DNA. They are the ultimate epigenetic switch. What they do with DNA is they now will wrap themselves around the DNA. They will bind to a specific site that speaks to whatever their two to four amino acids are. And what that, so it allows the DNA to kind of unwind. It exposes its binding site, it binds to that site. And what that does is it upregulates the production of proteins that essentially drive regeneration of the tissue gland or organ that it's there for from at a cellular level. So this is why we talk about organ regeneration. And we talk about it happening at a cellular level. So here's another interesting fact about bioregulators. They're native to your body. You make them when we're kids. When any of us who've had little kids, you can watch your little kid fall down, scrape his, his or her knee, and within 27 minutes later, it, the scrape's gone. It's kind of like the Wolverine, right? We lose that superpower as we age. So we lose bioregulator peptides as we age. We don't make them as efficiently, we don't make them as well, plus there's a lot more noise in the human body getting in the way, right? So what we're doing with bioregulator peptides is we're trying to reintroduce something into the body that we used to have a lot of to try and therapeutically kind of restart that mechanism of, of repair. 
So where do they come from and what form do they come in? So where the bioregulator peptides that are available to us now come in, in from one of two places. They either come from organs of tissues, glands, and organs of animals. The animals could be cows, they could be pigs, and they could be sheep. Okay? At some point, Cabinson, as he was isolating these bioregulator peptides and studying them, he realized, hey, we could actually re recreate this exact sequence in this exact orientation in a lab. And now we can create a synthetic version of the bioregulator peptide. So the oral biologic form, if you will, of the bioregulator peptide come in capsules. So this is where they've taken those tissues, glands, and organs, they've desiccated them, they've purified them, they've refined them, and they've basically extracted the bioregulator peptide and probably a bunch of different cofactors along with it and encapsulated it and are able to give us a fairly high dose. The synthetic bioregulator peptide is just the peptide. It's nothing else. There's no other noise around it. So in Russia, where they've been using bioregulators for many decades, they max, as a matter of fact, I have a very good friend who's a survivor of Chernobyl, and they were given bioregulator peptides to get to help them recover from that horrible event. So, um, so the synthetic bioregulator peptide will often be used for people initially, right? Because the bioregulator, think about it, it's the money shot. It goes directly to where it's going. There's no, nothing in its way. So it can be introduced into the body either by subcutaneous injection or they have them as sublingual sprays. And there are now companies that are creating them also as transdermal drops. There, there's lots of creativity going on in the space right now. Um, so, but typically we, we see them more, the most efficient way to deliver them will be by subcutaneous injection. The oral bioregulator is generally used after the fact. It, it can be used later or it can be used from the beginning. Like it can be either way. It really depends on the individual and the situation. This, the reason one would use a synthetic bioregulator for, first for sure is someone who has a lot of autoimmune issues or who's very sensitive. Because again, there's less there for them to react to outside of the bioregulator. Um, and then, but, so the, the book, synthetic bioregulator, this, this, its creed is that it's fast acting and maybe the effects don't last quite as long. Whereas the oral bioregulator takes longer to kick in, but the effects may last longer. So it really depends on the situation. There's a lot of art to the science of bioregulator peptides. Um, there's no written down recipes particularly. I'm gonna talk about a few stacks at some point, but basically that's, that's the scuttlebutt of the bioregulators. So what can we expect to happen in the bioregulator peptides? Again, we have no animation. There's things supposed to be happening here, but just imagine that there's really cool <laughs> visuals. Um, the bioregulator peptides in a healthy body, what we're gonna see is we're going to see what we were just talking about, this regeneration of organs. Imagine a tread on your tires that's kind of worn down. It's gonna restore the tread on the tire. It's not gonna make a super tread. It's just gonna restore the tread back to where it was so that it's not quite bald, right? In someone who's ill, we might, again, so we've got people who are kind of at the line of homeostasis. That person is working, if they're just a little below, we're gonna to try to keep them at that line. And I'm not gonna say the words I wanna say because I have a slide that's really good, but I'm gonna say and add. For the person who's sick and who's down here, the bioregulator is going to work towards bringing that person back into balance, back to homeostasis. So it, it, can, it has applications on both sides of the fence. Now remember I said there's 21 bioregulators that are commercially available. You can take a picture of this slide. I'm not gonna go through every one of these because we will be here until dinner. Um, <laughs> um, and these are essentially the, the organs and the tissues that we have bioregulators commercially available for. Most of them are available either as synthetic or as capsules. The, there are five that are not available in synthetic form, and that would be the adrenal, the muscle, 
there's no synthetic for adrenal, muscle, hang on, wait for it, bone marrow, thyroid, and I, there's one other one that is no, oh, and Vilo, we don't have as an oral. And Vilo is really interesting bioregulator. It's actually part of and the immune family of bioregulators. And so I actually, I believe that Vilon and the thymus bioregulator both come from the thymus gland. And so they're kind of two different bioregulators of the same place. And that's why we don't, we don't have it. Um, all right, so if you made me choose from my, who my favorite children are, which is a horrible question to ask, um, I would have to choose this stack. And let's see if this part of the animation is going to work for me. Yes. OK. <laughs> <laughs> we start with epitalon, which is epitalon is the pineal gland bioregulator. So the pineal gland, is, like it's so cool, right? The pineal gland is a pine nut shaped gland in the center of the brain. And what this gland does is nothing short of astounding. Right? So the pineal gland is capable of, and the pineal gland bioregulator, is capable of activating an enzyme called telomerase. And what telomerase does is it, it doesn't so much lengthen telomeres as it maintains the length of telomeres. Now telomeres are the ends of the DNA, and imagine that telomeres are made up of chiclets. If anybody's old enough to actually even know what a chiclet is. <laughs> um, and every time your DNA replicates, because it must, Right? You lose a chiclet off the bottom of the telomere. Once you have no chiclets left, the DNA can no longer replicate. Mm, sucks. Now, we don't want too many chiclets because if we have way too many chiclets, we're not looking at a cancer cell that can reproduce indefinitely. Right? So we want appropriate numbers of chiclets. <clears throat> Telomerase is able to, hold, to kind of maintain the length that we want. It normalizes melatonin production. Holy jumping. If you've done any reading on melatonin, you know that this is a hormone that is responsible for way more than sleep. It is the most powerful antioxidant in our body. And I think we're just scratching the surface of what this hormone does and why it's so important. It helps to restore circadian rhythm. So this does not mean that you get to stay until three o'clock in the morning and wake up at six and you're gonna be okay. But what does mean that is that if you made a commitment to restore your circadian rhythm so that you can be your healthiest, most functional self, this thing is gonna to help to reset that clock with you. And then last but not least, it actually um, resets the wrong word there. That got by me, I don't know how. It is the master regulator of the endocrine system. So imagine that it is the orchestra conductor of the entire endocrine system. Super cool. Now, it doesn't mean that you're gonna take a piddle on and all of a sudden all of your hormones are gonna be like, oh, and they're all gonna regulate. Not exactly, but it's the reason why we find this bioregulator at the foundation of almost any stack that we use. Now, one thing about bioregulators that I didn't mention yet is that they have many names. It's a little bit like going to Ikea. It sort of sucks. <laughs> Nothing against Ikea. I'm, I'm the builder of Ikea furniture in my house. I have lots of Ikea. I love it. There's some, it's kind of like Legos, soothing, sort of. My husband finds them stressful. Anyway, Epidolon also is known as endolutin. Now, endolutin is the name of the oral biologic. Somehow, the FDA learned about Epidolon and has added it to their list of class two compounds. So technically, we're not supposed to use it anymore. The good news is we can use endolutin, which is the oral capsule. Hopefully, nobody from the FDA is watching this, because then they'll probably want to take that away, too. Please so don't. It's really good, and it has, does no harm, really. Um, OK, how do I get back? Let's just see if I can get back. Yes. Um, my next, our next contestant, which wins top prize, is thymogen. Thymogen is a thymus bioregulator. What is going to get us in the end is our immune system. And frankly, at the foundation of so much of the aging process is a dysfunctional immune system. It's either an overactive or an underactive immune system. It's an immune system that's no, no longer firing the way it needs to. It's not sending out the soldiers we need, or it's sending out the soldiers every day saying there's a fire, there's a fire. So anything we can do to restore function to our immune system is gonna be good, right? Primogen's super important. So it gets place number two. The third spot goes to Vesugen, which is also called Ventfort. <laughs> uh, Vesugen 
restores health to the endothelium lining of blood vessels. Nothing in the body is going to happen if we don't have proper blood flow, both at a macro and a micro level. So we want the lining of that endothelium, we want it to be as healthy as possible. So does this mean you don't need to take your glycocalyx supplement? Not, a, not on your life. But it does mean that this can help to repair damage over time to the lining of the blood vessels. Um, next, okay, we all know, like if we can't draw breath, kind of problem, right? So, and, and really like, it's kind of, it's, it's kind of hard to pick because frankly, like without good kidneys, we're not gonna get too far either, right? So having said that, bronchogen probably also made the list because I created this a couple of years ago and at the time, lungs were at the top of everybody's kind of concerns. Um, but if we can, they, they did some really interesting clinical trials on people with COPD and bronchitis and they showed that if they gave these people bronchogen alongside conventional medication, they got better results and they got them faster and they lasted longer. So another really interesting thing about the bioregulators is they don't have to be used instead of medication. They can often be used with medication, right? And as a matter of fact, there's people in my, in my communities, one woman in particular recently, who's been struggling with Hashimoto's for years. She's been working with a functional medicine doctor for years and they've been getting nowhere. She worked with me for a little while last year. We created a protocol for her using the bioregulator peptides and she just like last week posted to the group, oh my God, my doctor is like, what the heck are you doing? Because her thyroid numbers are normalized. Right? And she's able to start weaning off her thyroid medication. So she didn't stop, to be clear, she did not stop her thyroid meds and start using the thyroid bioregulator. What she did is she worked with her doctor and little by little they're tracking her numbers and they're, they've been able, in her case, through working on lifestyle, working on all the things that are probably pissing off her immune system that's attacking her thyroid or whatever else is going on, they've been able to bring function back to the thyroid, and so now they're able to toggle back on her, her medication. Like, it is pretty amazing that they're able to do that. All right, liver gen, the liver. I think we can all agree the liver is actually pretty freaking important. Again, studies here have been shown that um, people with all kinds of liver dysfunction will benefit from using the liver bioregulator. And it, even to the point where it can help in a program of helping to normalize lead lipids. I'm probably gonna go over time to shoot. Okay, I better start talking faster. Ooh, look, we jumped ahead. Cartilax, why would I put the cartilage bioregulator ahead of kidneys or anything else? Like, I mean, cartilage is important, but here's the reason why. Because if you think about what cartilax does, it helps to upregulate the, pro the production of collagen and elastin. So as a vain person, I'm like, yeah, I want to live a really long time and I don't want to look like a raisin at the finish line, <laughs> right? So number one, it's going to help with skin. Number two, every single organ and part of you that contracts and expands, and that means your blood vessels, your kidneys, your heart, all of those things are dependent on collagen and elastin to function properly. So cartilax is really, really important. And plus, we also want joints, healthy joints. Did I forget anything? No. Nope. So act on the kidney, meaning as does the heart and all the other things. So now I need to go back to my presentation, please, and thank you. Good. Mm -hmm. All right. This is the slide I was waiting for. This is the hallmark of bioregulator peptides, and that is that they don't boost, they modulate. They bring back to homeostasis, right? So you can't, you almost, you can't take too much. I've seen very, very few negative impacts from bioregulators and if I do it's because it's someone who's got a lot going on and their system is hypersensitive and for the most part generally if they reduce their dose they're basically fine but the best way to exemplify this is with the thyroid bioregulator you can give the thyroid bioregulator to someone who is either hypothyroid or hyperthyroid so whether the thyroid is dragging its butt or overperforming what it's going to do is it's going to try to normalize that thyroid function. That's pretty freaking magical. Mm -hmm. And the same goes for every other bioregulator. You'll notice on the Epidolon slide, it said normalizes melatonin. 
doesn't boost melatonin. And they noticed in the studies that in elderly people, mm. it brought their melatonin levels back to that of a middle-aged, like kind of 40-ish person. It's not taking us back to where we were five. Because, <coughs> you know, it's like, yeah, we want to make you younger, but not too much younger. I just want to keep you healthy. Um, but it didn't boost melatonin production. And as a matter of fact, there were some people in the study that had too much melatonin, and it actually normalized it. And there are people out there who would argue that there's no such thing as too much melatonin. We're not going to get into that conversation. Let's just say that in the study, that what they noticed is that it... Um, it, it normalized it. Okay, so a lot of people are like, well, is there any research behind bioregulators? And it turns out that there's reams of research. The problem is a lot of it's in Russian. And, you know, relations between Russians and North Americans haven't always been the best. And so they're not so motivated to share. People here aren't always so excited to talk about what they do. The fact of the matter is that Kappensen spent his entire life studying these things and showing what they can do. So there was the 12-year elderly study. Now, the elderly term and the old people term, I did not come up with this. It's their terms. Okay. So the elderly study had about 260 to 74-year-olds in two different groups. He had a control group and test subjects. The control group were given, I think it's here, yeah, polyvitamin injections. And the test subjects were given epithalamin. Now, epithalamin is the third name of the pineal gland bioregulator. I kind of spared you the stress. So we have epithalamin, we have endolutin, and we have epithalamin. Epithalamin is an actual extract of pineal gland that is, that is compounded into something that can be injected intramuscularly. It's more or less only available in Russia. Number one, because just the thought of exporting and seeing these things gives people highs, it would really give the FDA or whoever reason to say, yeah, no, that's off-site, right? Anyway, epithalamin is probably the most potent form of the bioregulator. They were given the epithalamin for two years and the polyvitamins for two years. And what happened? After six years, the polyvitamin group against the control group had only a 13.6% mortality. Um, our polyvitamin, oh, sorry, polyvitamin group had 13.6% mortality. Our epithalamin group, 8.5% mortality. They're doing better, right? 5% is nothing to sneeze on. After 12 years, check it out, 44% mortality in the control group, only 22.3% mortality in the ep epithalamin group. You really wanted to be in test subjects this on this one. It could not be the result of a coincidence, that the genetic coincidence of that group. Of 200 started. people? Yeah, that's true, 200 people. It's not 10, yeah. 200. <laughs> uh -huh. Then we have our six year old people study. So this is the next age group up. These are 75 to 89 year olds. He didn't do 12 years here, obviously, because he didn't expect them to live that long. Um, we again have our control group versus we've got the polyvitamins. We have three groups here. We have our first test group who only get epithalamin, and we have our second test group who get epithalamin and the thymus bioregulator. Amazing things happen. We have, at the end of six years, 88% more challenge. The epithalamin group had 45.8% mortality. The people who got the support for the pineal gland and the thymus gland only had 33% mortality. It's kind of cool. These are expensive studies. Unfortunately, they have not been repeated ever since. Um, now, here's the other thing. Not only did they live longer, they were also healthier and they were happier. And this is because we're, you know, we can basically say if we can be metabolically more healthy, if we have better melatonin production, if our immune system is stronger, then every, and if our endocrine system is, is encouraged to be more balanced, we're going to, we're going to basically benefit from it on all fronts from the health perspective. There were given no, um, nobody ate a special diet. Nobody was told what to do and what not to do. They were just left to live their lives the way they felt in. So overall, they, they were healthier. Now, remember I said he was told that they had factories filled with people who they're living in Siberia, they're living a shitty life. <laughs> they work really hard. So we really have nothing to lose. We have 8,000 test subjects. We have 3,000 controls. Like these are big, big studies. It was a one year study. 
and here are the results. The, the control group were given polyvitamins again, <coughs> the test subjects were given five bioregulators. And I don't know why the list is not here. I wonder if, or we skip that slide. Okay, there was the pineal gland, there was the brain bioregulator, serlutin. So not so much the pineal gland in this case, they went for the central nervous system bioregulator. They gave them the lungs, because a lot of them are smokers. Um, blood vessel for sure, and I don't remember what the fifth one. You can email me, I'll, I'll dig it up for you. Bottom line, at the end of a year, we had a 50% reduction in acute respiratory disease in the test subjects. We had 66% reduction of overall incidence of, of disease. Um, and shockingly, not shockingly, as a result, they weren't sick, they were healthier. We, they had 66, they had an improved work performance and attendance, which to the company is like, that's a win, right? If I can keep people working harder and longer, everybody wins. Um, there is, he did animal studies. Now these have not been done in humans as it stands right now, but he looked at both the pineal gland bioregulator and Villon, which is one of the thymus gland bioregulators, and did studies on um, basically transgenic mice that are predisposed to HER2 positive breast cancers. And in both cases, although the Villon is, I think, more pronounced than Epidolon, they had fewer incidences of tumors, and they, if they did have them, they were smaller. So there's some good, good evidence there. So now what about high performance, right? What about people who perform? So this is an interesting study. Um, now we're moving into, um, bio, we're moving into more of the biological age studies. So some of the studies that the Russians did were on their Olympic athletes. And they found that the gymnasts, gymnasts, so on the women's gymnastics team, there's a really good study. Actually, I don't, I don't have it here, unfortunately. But they, were, they figured out that these kids were, their biological age was way accelerated after the Olympics. And so it's the stress, it's the training, it's all of the things that we know can drive, and both emotional stress and physical stress. Um, and they were able, through bioregulator peptides, we could a fairly short period of time of about a year to reverse that damage. Tora Bright, same thing, right? So she's a US gold medalist in snowboarding. Her trainers, for reasons I don't quite know, did a biological age test on her and realized that at the not so ripe old age of 32, she was showing up decades older. And so they approached a guy that I'm gonna talk about shortly and um, said, is there anything you can do? And so it took them about 18 months and they wound the back to the biological age clock. Now biological age is another one of those thorny issues in this space. It depends how you're measuring it. It depends on the lab you use. So I don't put too, too much store in it. I think biological age clocks are getting much, much better. I think we're really at the beginning of this whole science. And the company True Diagnostic, I think, is doing amazing work in this space. And every couple of months, they're coming out with something new. So I think, I think it's a space to watch. And certainly, you know, if I can reverse my biological age, I'd rather do that than not. So Bill Lawrence is the guy I was talking about. Bill Lawrence worked with Dr. Kevinson for many, a couple of, probably almost 20 years until Dr. Kevinson passed away. Um, Bill Lawrence, I've, I have two podcasts with him. So if you want to listen to the podcast I did with Bill where he talks about the results I'm going to talk to you about here, um, you're going to have to go back a couple of years. But they're really interesting episodes in the sense that he talks quite deeply about, he goes into more detail than I did today in terms of the origins of bioregulators and his work. Um, but his personal story is really interesting. This is a man who comes from a long line of, in four generations, no male lived past the age of, I think it was 75. All of them had a problem with their hearts. So he figured this out and he's like, mm, yeah, that stops here. And he came across Kevinson's work. He went back to school he got a master's in nutrition, this, that, and the other thing. He came across Kevinson's work. He got on a plane and threw himself at his feet in St. Peter's Spring and said, please work with me and help me. I don't want to die. Um, and I believe Bill is turning 77 this year. Um, he's, been, he's, he's now 
conducting a study, a lot, fairly large scale study with a couple of hundred people where they're taking bioregulator peptides every month. Um, I was in that study for a year, a couple of years ago. And so some people are taking up to nine bioregulators a month. And what he's showing, and I think I have the results here. So this is the telomere study. After two years, they've seen up to 30 year reduction in cellular age based on telomere life, which is kind of cool. The DNA methylation study, he has yet to publish his results on this, but once again, he did a proof of concept and he took nine participants using bioregulator peptides and on average, they were 5.4 years younger than their chronological age, whereas people who were not using bioregulator uh, bio peptides on average were almost two years older. Now, this is proof of concept. This is not, you know, this is not a study. These are very small sample sizes, but it still gives us an indication that maybe there's something there. My NF1, the last time I did my bio, read my biological age was, I was eight years younger than my chronological age and my telomeres were, I wanna say they were like about 25 years younger. They matched someone 25 years younger than me. So, you know, I think the bioregulators are super interesting space. Uh, but what I wanted to do was leave you guys with a couple of actionable things. How am I doing for time? We are to 45. It's 245 now? It's 245. So let's do a new question. Okay, soon questions. Okay, I'm gonna give you a couple of stacks. It's a couple of my favorite little stacks. So one thing about bioregulators, they're almost never used in isolation. We always use them in, in groups, okay? So the most foundational stack, and I've alluded to this before, would be your pineal gland, your thymus gland, and your blood vessel bioregulator. And what you might do, if you're under the age of 45, you might do a 30-day run of all three of these once a year. You might do it twice if you lead a very stressful life, right? It depends on the person. Over 45, you might do 30 days twice a year, six months apart, or depending on how much older you are, you might do it three times a year, or you might do it every three months. You might do a 30-day run, or you might do it every four months. If you're really concerned about brain health, you'd probably focus on the pineal gland bioregulator the central nervous system, and the blood vessel bioregulator. It's suffice to say that this is in addition to using things like plasmologins, or your essential fatty acids, or whatever, all of the other things we talk about in the biohacking space. And going back to one of those initial slides, you might want to throw spermidine into all of these, right? Um, another really good stack for metabolic balance, we're thinking about, we're thinking about the organs, right? What are the organs that are involved here? Well, the liver, the pancreas, and of course, we're going to go for the blood vessels. So how else can we slow aging? Well, there's so many other ways, right? So obviously, we want to eat properly. We want to, I, I keep forgetting what the roast is. It looks like a roast to me, but I think it's maybe cardiovascular health. Um, we want to exercise, and exercise is massive, and it's a roast. Doesn't it look like a roast? It's the worst icon on the planet. What is tasty? There's no worse icon than that icon. Anyway, exercise is hugely important because what's exercise going to do? The right exercise for us is going to help to keep our mitochondria healthy. Without my mitochondrial dysfunction, is one of the twelve hallmarks of aging. So you can regenerate your organs all you want. If your mitochondria are on their knees, nothing good's gonna happen, <coughs> right? So make sure that you're paying attention to all of these other pieces. The snowflake is about what they have down the hall, cryotherapy, deliberate cold exposure. Expose yourself to extremes in temperature because that's what's going to build resilience in your body. That's the other extreme. Sana, anybody? You could practice yoga would be really, really good. You could meditate would be even more better, right? One of the ways of lengthening telomeres and maintaining telomere length is meditation, interestingly enough. Sleep. Mm -hmm. Sleep. Sleep. I think it's Derek. Oh, that's the my God. It's the rose. It should be the rose. But sleep is 100%. Connection with nature. Connection with other people. Community. Getting outside. Rounding. All of these things are critical. Reducing our load of senescent cells, right? So senolytics also, you want to take out the trash 
That's what the sauna is about. That's what fasting is about. All of these things. You want to allow your, you want to facilitate your body to remove the trash so that when you bring in all this stuff, there's a cleaner path to regeneration. That's it. That's me. So for the next few weeks, It's going to be the Biohacking Superhuman Performance Podcast. As of, I'm praying the next couple of weeks, it's going to be the Longevity Podcast with Natalie Nidham. So just keep an eye out for it. Thank you so much, you guys. I really appreciate you being here and your attention. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I'm going to take the five um, questions now from the Zoom. The first question is, what's the best stack for injuries recovery? I fractured my two wrists a month ago looking for peptides to speed recovery. Mm, okay, well, I'm sorry to hear that. That sucks. Um, so those are that's where we're going to look to the longer chain peptides. So it turns out, look, Cardilax would be great if you're looking at a bioregulator peptide. Um, the blood vessel peptide would be great because it's going to help with any kind of circulation issues you might have. They in and of themselves are not going to fix your wrist. What you're looking for, what the answer this person is looking for is to do with the longer chain peptides. So I'm going to preface this by saying, A, I'm not a doctor, and B, longer chain peptides are offside according to our regulatory bodies right now. But if we were to dial it back to six months ago, before they were offside, what I might think about using, I might think about DPC-157, I might think about thymus and beta-4, and I might think about the growth hormone secreted box. I might throw in GHK copper, mm -hmm. because GHK copper is a peptide that is really important for wound healing. Um, and it actually, it has many, many different functions. But there's other things you can use. I would, if I was you, I would lean into essential amino acids, like if there's no tomorrow. I would use something like, there's a supplement called Stem Regen. Stem Regen, you guys sell it here. Stem Regen is one of the most unbelievable supplements out there right now. It is an herbal formula that has been clinically proven. Every time you take two capsules, it mobilizes 10 million of your own stem cells out into the bloodstream. They will be attracted to areas of inflammation in your body. If you have two broken wrists, I can promise you, they're sending out the, they're sounding the alarm day and night. So those, those things are really, those two things are fantastic. Things like red light therapy and infrared light therapy are gonna be really important. The sauna's great because it increases your levels of growth hormone and testosterone, not growth hormone. Um, and then there's one more tool which you actually haven't got here yet, I'm shocked, and I'm sure you will soon, and those are katsu bands. Katsu bands are variable blood flow restriction bands, and they are for healing injuries, nothing short of miraculous. They're also amazing for high performance. They're incredible for your grandmother if she's forgetting her name, because what they do is they improve blood flow throughout the entire body. They also send a signal to the brain that there's stress in the body. And so in response, the brain is gonna upregulate levels of growth hormone, upregulate levels of testosterone. Like these guys with that tool have healed Olympic athletes weeks before an Olympic event, and people have gone on to I don't know if they won medals, but they competed. So that's your answer. I hope it helps. Thank you. The second one is with current peptides being banned in Florida, what are the top five peptides for immunity, longevity, muscle recovery, and weight control fat burn? Oh, and a lot. Two. It's a hell of a 30 second answer. <laughs> <laughs> so when it comes to the last one, the weight control, Fat burn, those are non banned. You're talking about semaglutide, which is Plusempic, and you're talking about Munjaro, which is Terzepatide. Those are far from banned, right? You, if you are, if you have a weight problem, you can go to your doctor and you should be able to get a prescription for those. Um, I have a whole, I have a lot to say about how to use those properly. And that whole stack I gave that person with the essential amino acids, the stem region, the exercise, katsu bands, would, those would be really helpful, but. That's a different, different topic. Um, what were the things? <laughs> everything. Everything. Just everything. Yeah, everything. Yeah. Things? I think that's See, the longevity muscle. We talked so about longevity, things. we talked about here. Yes. So we talked about that in the presentation. Muscle recovery. It's going to. You can actually use oral peptides. So oral peptides. There are certain peptides that are bioavailable orally. And again, you guys carry here. 
uh, Level Up Health BPC-157 and Total Body Recomp. Those would be really interesting formulas to play with along with the stem regen. What else? There was like five things. It was... Um, oh, immunity. Immunity, uh, right? It was immunity. So thymus, the thymus one? Yes. Epidolon and vino. Although vino you won't find because it's synthetic and it's hard to get, but thymus, the thymogen. So one thing about the bioregulators I probably should mention is that availability of oral bioregulators has been a nightmare since the war broke out between Russia and the Ukraine. The good news is that there's a company that I work with who is solving for X. They've been solving for X for months and we are weeks away from the solution. So you could go to my website, natdenham.com, sign up for my newsletter and I will make an announcement as soon as they're available, which should be by the end of May. Isn't there a, an issue of um, efficiency on the oral peptides as opposed to... It the, depends on the peptide, not the bioregulators. Right, so BPC-157. So, so they're just as, as efficient uh, orally as they are? As yeah, efficient? I mean, a lot, of, uh, a lot of Russian research was done on the orals. And all of Bill Lawrence's work is done with the orals. Really? All of his work. He doesn't use any synthetic. He doesn't want anything to do with synthetic peptide bioregulators. Now, BPC-157 is orally bioavailable, and that's because it originates in gastric juice. So for, you know, in... For people, like in the absence of the injectable form of BPC-157, you can use, there's an oral form that you have both from Level Up Health and from Health Jevity. And also they, they've taken the fragments of thymus and beta-4 and made them bio, orally bio -based. So they're not really effective by the gastric yes, juice? Not BPC-157. It gets, it gets a buy. So it does, it does depend on the peptide? On the 100%. Yeah. I have one last question from Zoom. Why are some peptides must be taken in the morning and others at night? Because they'll keep you up. <laughs> it depends on the peptide, right? So it just, it depends on, you know, like with the growth hormone secretagogues, when people were using those, it was important to take them on an empty stomach. And even then you were injecting them, you weren't taking them orally because those would be, they would be digested just like a protein, right? Um, but it was important to take them on an empty stomach because if your body, when your body releases insulin, the insulin automatically blocks the production of growth hormone. So it's like driving your car and having your foot on the gas and the brake at the same time. You're not gonna go very far. So you wanna be fasted. So in many cases, and also those growth hormone secretagogues, for example, they helped with sleep. So it, was, it made sense to take them at night. Um, BPC-157 is less, it's, you know, BPC-157, typically can be taken at any time of day. It's best taken twice a day. Um, one thing about BBC 157 I want to mention, because I've now seen this too many times, is if, and it's hard to say who's really affected by this, but there are certain people, not a lot, but there are certain people who don't respond well to BBC 157 neurologically. So it makes them very anxious. It can make them um, angry. And so if you're, whenever you're using anything like what we're talking about today, keep a diary, right? Measure your metrics, look at your HRV, look at your sleep, look at how you're feeling, check out your energy because notice how you're feeling because if you, things start to slide or go sideways, you're gonna wanna stop what you're doing. It may not have nothing to do with these things, but you're gonna, if this is the thing that you've just introduced, you need to stop it go back to your baseline and then maybe reintroduce them or reintroduce one at a time, depending on how you were feeling, to try and figure out what the problem is. First, congratulations. Thank you. Wait, man, that's a lot of That's a hand. I want to tell you that uh, when I did my master at Columbia University, New York, we had, uh, in public health, we had two courses uh, specialty for hormonal therapy. Yeah. One of them was a doctor from Russia. Yeah. The pipe, the pineal gland, and the chef d'orchestre. You say chef d'orchestre. C'est exactement ce que j'ai dit. Exactement. It's yeah. The chef d'orchestre of all the, the organs. That, exactly. Yeah. And it's why when you talk about pineal gland, it's very, very important. One question I'm asking you, as I'm from Eve, what's for stress? Any peptide for stress? <laughs> <laughs> You know, I would say that for, for it depends, right? If your if your adrenal function is not optimal, so what 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 does the what does stress affect, right? It cranks up cortisol until your adrenals yes. can't make cortisol anymore. Yes. If the adrenals are dragging, 
the thyroid is going to grab onto the thyroid and drag it back to slow it down. So I would say for stress, you're going to have to work on work on, man work on <laughs> stress management strategies. But if you're asking me what bioregulators I would look at, I would look at the adrenal, the thyroid, the central nervous system, and the pineal gland. And probably I would throw in the blood vessel just because you need that. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. I have, a, I have a couple of questions. <clears throat> Typically, when somebody when when somebody starts on that on that on that journey, there's very little formal information out there on particularly on peptides. Mm -hmm. Is there a uh, you know when you're gonna go see a doctor for a hormone panel, so they do a test for you, and you have all the hormones. The doctor says, okay, these are the levels. Then we're going yeah. to supplement this and that. Peptides trigger your own organs mm -hmm. to produce whatever. Well, just to work better. That's right. Yeah. Is there a process that someone can go through where are there tests that you can do? And then once you do these tests, is there a protocol, are there protocols out there that you can follow in order to compensate for deficiencies that you have? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think, you know, like basically, so what we would measure, we would look at thyroid function, right? we might look at adrenal functions, that we, in whatever way we can measure those things, right? So adrenal function, we're looking at the cortisol curve. Uh, we look at, you know, if you wear any kind of wearable, you might look at your sleep metrics, your heart rate variability, your deep sleep, that kind of thing. And you would basically, for cardiovascular health, you're gonna look at blood pressure, you're gonna, you're, you're gonna look at all of these things. I would say that, like I, the woman with the thyroid function coming back, that was the bioregulators. I've seen other women who have who had lost their cycle or still cycling, um, used a pitalon, they used the pineal gland bioregulator, they used the ovarian bioregulator. In some cases, they might use adrenal and thyroid. Their cycle came back. So there's not there's not a test that says you're deficient in the pineal gland bioregulator or the thyroid bioregulator. What you need to look at is the downstream. Right? So what Bill Lawrence is measuring is telomere length and he's measuring DNA methylation markers. So the telomere length, but what he's seen, and there were two people on that list. This is, this is a lot of this is covered in more detail than those two episodes I did with him. There were two people on that, that chart who hadn't seen any progress in their telomeres. And I'm like, so what's up with those two? And he said, those two people, and this was so interesting, he goes, I know every one of these people, and those two people happen to be living, incre going through incredibly stressful events in their lives. And even the bioregulators weren't able to improve their telomere length because stress is the big equalizer, right? So that takes me to my, my next question. You had a table where you put all these- Bioregulators? Um, bioregulators, so uh, what they affect, long and is is there a table that connects the function and the peptide itself? So I say somebody says, okay, I want, I want something for my lungs. Yeah. Is there anywhere that you can go and go, so I know I can get it from, from the internet, but yeah. is there something official or something? So there's, yeah, like, that's a good, format? again, so basically like we're still in the, pl in the space where, you know, there aren't a lot of doctors or practitioners working with these, but that's there right. are some. That's right. But there are some. Right, so it just, um, it's about finding those people. Like I have a membership community, we're about to start uh, a group where we're, I called it the year of bioregulators. And we're going to be doing a health intake for, we're doing a health intake for people. We're looking at what are the areas of focus they wanna focus on, and we're gonna cycle through all the peptides for the year. But in their case, I mean, like let's say someone, for me, Let's say, let's take me for example, right? In my family, we have high blood pressure. We have, um, we have a lot of high blood pressure. We have type two diabetes, like that late onset type two diabetes um, and, and arthritis, right? So I might, in my year of bioregulators, I will probably repeat the bioregulators that affect the organs that are involved in those imbalances more often than I do others. So that, that takes me to the last point, <laughs> the, the cycling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, which, and, and a lot of people don't understand that 
you have to cycle. A hundred percent. And and what are the cycles? I mean, so you, the cycles and again, are, I'm asking those questions. Really, yeah. they're they're not rhetorical, but they're really to get an answer from you to vulgarize this information. Yeah, because yeah. Because yeah. a lot of people don't realize that mm -hmm. you have to you have to cycle. But they don't all, all cycle the same way. You know, some of them it's three months. Some depending on depending on the on, on, the on, yeah, but you're it also depends on the dose. So and the you know what you. The other thing is that, let's say, like the woman who was who had the thyroid issue, she didn't do 30 days, 30 days, 30 days, 30 days. She probably did, and I mean, I wasn't privy to the data, like they were watching her numbers. She probably did a 30-day cycle, if she was listening to me. So she would have done a 30-day cycle of her stack, with including thyroid by regulator. If nothing moved, we might repeat the 30-day cycle, but after that, we're gonna go 10 days on, 20 days off. 10 days on, 20 days off, why? Because the body responds better to pulses than it does to continuous noise. That's it. Pulsing. Right? Pulsing. We yes. want to pulse. Of Everything course. in nature pulses. Of course. Right? Of course. So feast, famine. Absolutely. Hot, cold. Absolutely. Give a signal and then, you know what? Back off and let the body do what it's going to do. Right? You can't just keep hitting the button. Signal, 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 signal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Not a lot of people. Do Thank you for asking that question because I left that out for some reason today. But that's a really important point. And that in this, in, in, in even in Bill's study, it's ten days. If you're taking nine bioregulators in a month, it's going to be ten days of three, ten days of three, ten days of three, and then the next month it might be ten days of three different ones and three different. But ones. you know, that, Leah, I think it's, it's something that really is needed out there. Is is a, is a I wouldn't say maybe a reference book or, or something that people could consult mm -hmm. that tells them these doctors, the list of doctors that, that they can reach out to because people have a ten because peptides are so new yeah. and there's mm -hmm. all these fight between big pharma and, and, and not big pharma and they're trying to, to ban all these but, but the benefits are so big people want yeah. to try them yeah. and, and a lot of times it, it's counterproductive because they don't know how to use them. So really. where to start? Yeah. Well, so, or where so for to the start. and well, or where and, to start? And the other thing is, with the long chain peptides, you can screw yourself up. Absolutely, you, you can hurt yourself. You can do damage, one hundred percent. So I would go to so number one on the podcast that I host. There are a number of doctors that I've interviewed where we've talked about peptides. Okay, so I would invite you to check check it out, and those doctors are there. They are in a very difficult position right now. Of course. Right? Mm. Uh, but they're out there and they, they're familiar with peptides. More than familiar, some of them teach about peptides. Um, A4M, I think they used to have a listing because they've trained doctors. Where the, where the gap really is, is the bioregulators. There aren't as many doctors. There are doctors that, talk, that, that are working with bioregulators, they're just harder to find. But sometimes, Thank I'm, you. Able, sometimes I'm able to point people in the right direction. I, I feel that some people don't understand what bioregulators are as well because it's such a new word. So peptide mm -hmm. is a trending word and mm -hmm. people know peptides, peptides, peptide. Nobody knows to look for bioregulators, which is another form of peptide as well. Yeah. So um, I, I, I feel that maybe it should start being a trending word so people not know. Well, well, it will. There's still not a lot of people. I talk about them, but there aren't a lot of people. I just did a bioregulator basics. <clears throat> episode on like by myself for half an hour I, I actually it's a it's a nip it's an episode that I released almost a year ago that didn't get a lot of traction the first time so I just thought okay I'm not gonna repeat myself I just re-released it recently mm -hmm. and it got more track you know it's about more people hearing about it and to your point that's why I took the time at the beginning to differentiate between the bioregulator peptides and the longer chain peptides because they are different things work differently I wasn't there so here I was on the phone but did you explain how they work? Yeah. Oh, okay. No, or you know what? It, the even faster is the bioregulator basics episode of the podcast. Okay. It's half an hour. Okay. It'll give you the. Yeah, we should put that link on for everyone. Mm -hmm. I have a quick question. I got. Uh, I think we did five already. <laughs> <laughs> It's it's regarding women specifically I and I don't know and and hormones. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because some of us it's progesterone, some of us it's uh, estrogen, it varies. Yeah. 
So are there specific protocols with peptides for some of these imbalances that can help that so, journey? Yeah, so here's the, so here's what's so interesting about the bioregulators, right? Is because they're trying, they're, they, they go, they work really far upstream, right? So what you're, what you're, what you're signaling is the ovaries, the central nervous system, the thyroid gland, the adrenals. So you're not saying I need more of this or I need more of that. You're essentially helping to bring function back to the organs and the glands and tap into the wisdom of your own body. It's not going to replace bioidentical hormone therapy, right? We have for men, we have a prostate bioregulator and testes. And I can tell you again that there are, there are practitioners and physicians that have been very successful in helping couples with fertility issues using the bioregulator problem. peptides not alone and it depends on what the issues are but they can be they can be woven through protocols sometimes they even avoid IVF sometimes it depends right it depends how far gone they are it depends on on many different things in older men who get up to pee like 975 times a night in the night to go to the bathroom I've seen the prostate bioregulator used and I'll I'll stack it I'll do prostate bladder and blood vessel and we'll set, we'll do a 30 day stack and then we might do 10 days a month for a few months. And I don't go to the bathroom in the middle of the night anymore or I only have to get up once. That's a win. Mm -hmm. Huge. That's a win. Right? It's a win. Especially when you're an older people. I mean, you're an older man who keeps twerking up like that. His sleep is going to be it's affected. Killing it's killing right? And it's going to gonna, of course. It's going to affect his brain. It's going to affect his, his blood pressure. It's going to affect his blood sugar regulation. It's going to affect all the things. See, I wasn't so boring. I kept you here till the end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, no, there's no more questions. I'm going to wrap the talk of the day. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, you guys. Thank you so much.